So let's wait a couple of minutes, everyone. And till we have, I oh, already have almost 50 people. So wait for a minute and begin. All right, let's begin. So uh, good morning all. We're going to continue with uh, the fifth lecture in the series on recurrent neural networks. Today's topics are sequence to sequence models. And specifically, we're going to consider connectionist temporal classification. Now, the biggest use for RNNs is sequence to sequence conversion. A problem that we've already begun, been talking about, but we haven't actually explicitly introduced. So here's the problem. You have an input sequence, x1 through xn of some length n. From that, you want to compute an output sequence y1 through ym of some length n. So typical problems are speech recognition. The input is a sequence of speech samples and the output is a sequence of words or machine translation. The input is a sequence of words in one language. The output is a sequence of words in another. Or dialogue systems. The input is a user question. The output is a system response. All of these are instances of uh, sequence to sequence conversion, where a sequence goes in and a sequence comes out. And in general, the length of the input sequence and the length of the output sequence need not be the same. So let's consider the different situations. In speech recognition, there's an order correspondence between the input and the output. So if you say, I ate an apple, the portion of the audio that corresponds, the, the desired output is the word sequence, I ate an apple. And the portion of the audio that corresponds to the word I is going to come before the portion of the audio that comes that corresponds to the word eight. So although the input and output are not one-to-one, -one, there's order correspondence. In machine translation, you won't find this order correspondence. For example, you could input a sentence, I ate an apple in English, and this must be translated in German to ich habe einen Apfel gegessen. So the lines over, so here is the input that you'll be putting in, here's the output, and the lines here show the correspondence. Eight is the second English word that is input, but in the output, it translates to two words, habe gegessen, and these words are not even adjacent. Also, the output in German here is longer than the input in English. So you have neither time synchrony nor order correspondence. In cases like dialogue, the input may be a user typing, my screen has gone blank. And the system outputs, please check if your computer is plugged in. Now, the input and output are not even directly related. And all of these are instances of sequence to sequence conversion, which can be done with recurrent neural networks. And we have been talking about this case in the last class where the input and output are order aligned, but not time synchronous. So let's recap what we've seen so far quickly. Here, the input and output have order correspondence, although they aren't time synchronous. So the output symbols are emitted intermittently at specific instance, which means we can align the output sequence against specific times for the input, like in speech recognition. Here, we have to address two problems. The first is how do we perform this kind of order aligned but time asynchronous inference? And secondly, how do we train such models? So let's consider inference first. We've already seen one solution to inference, which was uh, the greedy decode. Again, uh, here, the objective of inference is given a sequence of inputs. We would like to intermittently output a sequence of symbols. We call this process decoding. And we want to find the sequence of output symbols that is most likely given the input. So formally, formally, we try to find the most probable 
compressed symbol sequence given the inputs. What I mean by a compressed symbol sequence is, is that this sequence over here can be of can is shorter than the is potentially shorter than the input and can potentially be extended by repeating the symbols into a fully time aligned sequence. So the greedy solution for this here, we realize that the net actually outputs probabilities at every time. So we just pick the most likely symbol at each time and then merge adjacent symbols and output the actual symbol only at the end of each segment. But then greedy decoding can have these problems. It cannot distinguish between actual repetitions of a symbol and a single occurrence of the symbol. Also, this is suboptimal in that it finds the most likely time synchronous output, whereas what we want is the most likely order synchronous output, which may be shorter than the input. But for now, we will assume that we have a, a, a first answer to this inference problem. We're going to return to this for a better, better answer in, in a little while. But then after having looked at that in the previous class, we looked into training. We know that if you're given alignment information, what I mean by alignment information is timing information. If you're told at which input time each of these output symbols is, uh, is to be emitted, then we can train the model. And the way we would, we would do it is to convert this to a time synchronous sequence by repeating symbols and then compute the divergence from the time aligned sequence as a sum of the KL divergences at the between the uh, actual and the target output, tar target output symbol in this alignment. And this KL divergence, which is the sum over all time of the KL divergence between the actual output and the aligned symbol at that time, simply uh, collapses to the negative of the sum of the log probabilities assigned by the network to the aligned symbol at each time. This equation is important. Is important. We're going to see it again and again. Now, the derivative of this divergence with respect to the output at any given time, t, is going to be a vector of this form. It, is, it has all zeros except at the position of the target symbol in the aligned sequence. That component is minus one over the probability assigned to the symbol. Using this gradient, we can then train the network parameters using back propagation through time. So that's where we were in the last class. The tougher case is when the output sequence is given, but the alignment is not provided. So here, one approach is to guess the alignment, initialize it somehow, and then train the model with those initial alignments, then re-estimate the alignment using Witterby alignment, and then using use the re-estimated alignments to retrain the model and iterate. And because this alignment procedure is, uses the Witterby algorithm, we will sometimes call this training procedure Witterby training. And so here's where we end it with the fact that while Witterby, the Witterby training procedure is reasonable, it is prone to poor local optima because it's heavily dependent on the initial alignment. And if that is bad, then the final solution too is poor. So we have a code here. Let me launch it. Ten seconds, guys. Mm -hmm. 
So both of these statements are true. Viterbi training explicitly estimates the alignment of each training instance and then computes the divergence for the estimated alignment. For this, you need to re-estimate the alignments in every iteration because after each iteration, your model is improved. And so you will get a better alignment. But then the solution is not optimal. So that led us to this second solution. Instead of guessing the alignment, let's consider all possible alignments. To understand how we do this, let's go back to this figure from the last class. We compose this reduced table of probabilities for the label sequence by pulling out the corresponding rows from the output probability table for Viterbi alignment. So if the uh, target label sequence was beefy, then we would pull out the probability uh, row for B, E, for and E again, stack them, and we operate off this table. And Viterbi alignment found the best path from this top node, the top left node, to the bottom right node as your guest alignment. The reason we got suboptimal training when we guessed a single alignment was that even though you found the most likely alignment for your current model, if the model you are using is poor, as it will be in the initial stages of training, the alignment can be way off. And as a result, your updated model is also going to be poor. But then let's look at it differently. There are many paths from the source to the sink of this graph. And each of these paths represents a potential alignment and has a probability, which is the product of all the nodes in the path from the source to the sink. If we normalized all of all of these path probabilities by their sum, then we can view the set of probabilities for all of the paths as a probability distribution over the paths. Now, the sum of the probabilities of all of these paths is actually the probability of this compressed unaligned sequence that we form the graph from. So the normalized probability distribution where you make the probabilities of all the paths sum to one is actually the probability distribution over all paths through the graph conditioned on this unaligned sequence. In other words, it is the probability distribution over all alignments of this unaligned sequence. Now, selecting an alignment from this, uh, select, selecting an alignment from this graph is, this, is, is essentially the same as drawing an alignment from this distribution. And selecting the most probable alignment is the same as deterministically always drawing the most probable value from this distribution. Now, instead of always selecting the most probable alignment and computing the divergence from it, we could instead compute the expected divergence over all alignments. Now, as we've already seen, given an alignment, the divergence is simply the negative of the sum of the log probabilities assigned to the aligned symbol at each time. So instead of computing this term for just one alignment that we've guessed from this graph, we will compute the average value of this term over all possible alignments from this graph. So we're going to commit, we're going to take the expectation of this term over all alignments as our divergence. This doesn't commit us to a single uh, possibly poor alignment. So, before I continue, is this making sense to you kids? I need a few yeses. How, whether it's computationally expensive or not is something we will deal with, but is this making sense? Okay, perfect, right? So this is the expectation of a sum. And so using the linearity of expectation, I can move the expectation inside because the expectation of this of a sum is the same as the sum of expectations. So the and so now you and the divergence becomes the sum over all time, the negative of the sum over all time of the expectation of the log of y st 
and this is and this term over here is just the sum over all symbols in the sequence the sum over all symbols in the sequence of the uh, a posteriori probability of aligning the time t to that symbol times the log probability assigned to the symbol at that time and the overall divergence is the uh, negative sum of, of this inner expectation term taken over all time. So this may not make a lot of sense to you, but it will in a few seconds. Uh, so again, what does this mean here? The divergence we saw is the negative of the sum over all time of the expected log probability of the various symbols in the sequence at that time. So what is this term here? This term is the expectation of the log of the probability of B, or it's the average of the log of the probability assigned to B at time T, the probability assigned to E, the probability assigned to F, and the probability assigned to E. So uh, when I take the average, basically uh, the, uh, when I take the expectation, what I do is sum over all of these symbols, the, this term, this log probability, the product of this term, this, this log probability, and the probability of aligning that symbol to the input at that time. So this first term over here is the probability that the symbol S aligns at input time T given the unaligned sequence, because we are restricting, restricting ourselves to this, and the entire input. And we need to be able to compute this term. To, to compute the expectation. So I'm not sure that if this idea has come across, but to test it, I'm going to uh, have a poll. Let's see if this one comes through. Ten seconds, guys. Okay, I stop this. Okay. The training without alignment procedure computes the average divergence over all possible alignments of the label sequence. Now, which means the second statement must be false because you're computing the average divergence over all possible alignments. There's no need to explicitly compute the alignment of the label sequence to the input. So uh, that sort of leads to this equation. Observe what happened. We just summed over all time. And at each time, we just took the average or the expected value of the log probabilities assigned to all the input symbols at that time. And the expected value is simply going to be the, the log probability times the probability of aligning this symbol to that time summed over all of these, all of the symbols at that time. So this guy over here gives you the expected log probability of the aligned symbol at each time. And then there's a separate summation over time. So there's no real alignment being computed because you're only computing expected log probabilities. And this log of y is, is freely obtained because this y is the output that y represents these probabilities in the table. That is output by your network. That's what you use to compute this table. So the only unknown is this probability term over here. That's what we need to compute. And so what is that term? If I go back here, this probability is the probability of assigned aligning some symbol S to the input time T. 
given the input and the constraint sequence itself. Yes, Tushar? Um, no, I'm clear. I'm, question. No. I okay, don't. right. Yeah. So if I look at it in this figure, the probability, that probability term is going to be basically proportional, uh, uh, refers to the probability that the alignment of the symbol sequence to the input is such that the symbol S aligns to time T. In other words, the alignment paths, that is the probability, that is the total probability of, that's proportional to the total probability of all alignment paths that go through this node, because this node represents the event that the symbol E is aligned to time three. And so when I want to compute this probability term over here, this expectation term over here, wait, no, sorry, this probability term over here, the probability of aligning a specific symbol to a specific time instant, what I'm really computing is the, the total probability of all paths that go through the node that align that symbol to that time conditioned on the input sequence. So is this making sense, guys? Everything builds off this, so is this making sense? Okay, so yeah. So basically this probability term over here is going to be the total, the probability, a posteriori probability of aligning the art symbol to time t is proportional to the total probability of all paths that go through the node that represent that event. In other words, it is the total probability of this pink subgraph over here. And this can be decomposed as the total probability of this subgraph in blue, which is the all paths leading from the source node to this node times the total probability of this red subgraph conditioned on the blue subgraph. That's just Bayes' rule. And so what is the second term? It's the total probability of all paths in this red portion of the subgraph conditioned on the initial portion of the alignment being one of the paths in this blue subgraph. So I can decompose the total probability of this pink subgraph into these two terms. The first term is this, the total probability of this blue subgraph. And the second term is the total probability of the red subgraph conditioned on the blue subgraph. Is this making sense? Is this decomposition making sense, guys? Yes? All right. Professor? Perfect. Yeah. Uh, professor, I have a question. Go um, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, can you explain what it means when you move the big S over to the left side in the expression? So, this one, okay. This guy over here is the total probability of all paths through this node, all alignments that uh, align E to time T conditioned on the actual label sequence being D phi, correct? Yeah. So th this symbol over here says, this is proportional to the total probability of all alignments that place E at time three and having B phi be the actual symbol sequence. Okay. And when I compute this, so what is the relationship between these two? You will see that in a few minutes. Observe that each path over here is an alignment that results in this compressed sequence, right? If you consider the total probability of all paths in this graph, what is the total probability of all paths in this graph going to be? Can you tell me? One. No. The total probability of all paths in this graph is the total probability of all alignments of B phi to the input. Correct? That is going uh, to be the yeah, total. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yes. So that's going to be the total probability of B phi. Okay. Right. So 
by moving the s to the left i'm saying this is the joint probability of of b phi and aligning e to time three which is all that we can get from this graph does that make sense yeah thank you okay so we have this decomposition but then you have this conditional dependence across these two graphs but then you have something called conditional independence in a recurrent neural network uh, here is the dependency plot for the recurrent neural network the input uh, determines the hidden state variables h deterministically and so once x is given h is fixed and once h is given the output probabilities at any time depend only on h so the output probabilities that you compute at time one do not depend on the output probabilities that you compute at time zero because h is already fixed by the input and what probabilities or what symbols you choose at this time do not influence h so that means the probabilities that you compute at each time are independent of the probabilities that you compute at the, at any other time now this kind of independence would not hold if the symbol that you got at this time was fed back into the input but because it's not because this is the dependency the probability at any time probabilities at any time are independent of the probabilities at any other time because h is given so that means that in this graph the total probability conditional probability of the blue subgraph on this red subgraph i have switched the colors over here uh, the con but the point is that the conditional probability of the blue subgraph on the red subgraph is the same as the probability of the blue subgraph itself because this blue subgraph is is independent conditionally independent of the red subgraph given the input that means the total probability of this graph can be decomposed into two terms the probability of this red subgraph and the probability of the blue subgraph so i'm going to call this probability of the red subgraph that ends at this node the forward probability of this node which aligns this the arc symbol to time t so i'll represent it as alpha tr i'll call this blue subgraph the backward probability of this node it doesn't include the node itself but it's all paths leading out of the node. So I'll call this the backward probability of this node and call it beta tr because it's a total probability of all paths that that uh, follow when the arc symbol is aligned to time t. Now, so this first term I'm going to call the forward probability and let's see how we can compute it. Now, alpha tr is the total probability of this subgraph. It's the total probability of all paths from the source node to the node that aligns the arc symbol to time t. But then, if you consider it, there are in this graph there are only two ways of arriving at this node, at this at this rt node. One of them, and one of them is through this red node, and one of them is through this green node and so uh, alpha tr is the probability of of uh, the subgraph total probability of the subgraph ending at this node times the pro times the probability of continuing that subgraph onto this node so it's the total probability of this guy plus the total probability of the subgraph ending at the green node times the probability of extending it to this node. So is this decomposition making sense, guys? Yeah, chow down, that's great, right? And so now, so more generally, I can, so I can say the pro probability over here of 3E is the probability of the probability of the subgraph ending at 2B times Y3E plus the probability of the subgraph ending at this place to e times y3e right so or more generally it's the sum over all predecessors of rt at the previous time so you sum over all the symbols that are allowed to come before sr in an alignment so that's the sum over all of these of the probability of the subgraph ending at the predecessor 
times the probability of the current node itself. So now, are you guys seeing a symmetry over here? Anyone seeing a symmetry? What is this first term? What is the probability of the subgraph that ends here? Anyone? Alpha 2b. Correct. And this one? Alpha 2b. That's alpha 2. Correct. And so I can just write that alpha 3e is alpha 2b times y3e plus alpha 2e times y3e. Or more generally, uh, you're, you're going to say that the alpha tr is the sum over all predecessors of tr of the alpha for the predecessor times the probability at tr. So this little, what happened is that we've, compute, we've computed the alpha for a symbol at time t, for a node at time t in terms of the alphas at time t minus one. And so this gives us a recursion, recursive relation for alpha, for alpha that this is not the Viterbi algorithm. In the Viterbi algorithm, you are picking the best, most likely predecessor. You're summing here, you're summing over all predecessors. So, uh, but it's similar, very similar, right? And so now this gives us this recursive algorithm, which says recursive relation alpha tr is the sum over all predecessors of tr of the alpha of the predecessor times the probability at tr. And so uh, the alpha at alpha for any node at time t can be computed in terms of the alphas at the previous term. And writing it out explicitly for our graph over here, for every symbol, there are only two predecessor, predecessors in our graph. Uh, you have for a symbol in the R row, you can either have the same symbol R row at, at time t minus one or the previous row R minus one at t minus one. So alpha tr is alpha t minus one R plus alpha t minus one R minus one times YTR, YTS. So this gives us our recursive forward algorithm. You start from time zero and then go through time. And at each time you compute the alpha values for all the nodes in the column for that time based on the alpha values at the previous time, previous column. So here's how this would work. You initialize the alphas for the, uh, for the first column by setting the, the alpha values at time zero. Now alpha zero zero, which is this node on the top, uh, represents the total probability of the subgraph that both begins at this node and ends at this node. So this subgraph has only one node and the probability of the subgraph is simply going to be y zero b or more generally y zero as zero. Now, because the graph is not allowed to begin at any of these nodes, the alpha values for all of these guys is going to be zero. Then you move forward one time and then you use these alpha values and using the uh, recursive formula for alpha that we just saw, you can compute the alphas for all of the uh, nodes in this column. And then using the alphas for the nodes in that column, uh, again over here, observe that I have two special cases because the first row all node only has one predecessor. I've treated it separately than for the subsequent nodes, which have two predecessors. So for the alphas for the subsequent nodes, you would actually be summing uh, two terms from the previous column. Whereas for the first row, you only get one term from the previous column, but that just has to do with the number of predecessors for each of these nodes. Now, once you've computed the alphas for all of these nodes, we can go to the next time and compute the alphas for all of these nodes from the alphas over here, then take another step forward, compute the alphas for all of these nodes from the alphas over here, and so on, till you compute the alphas for all of the nodes in the graph. So is this making sense to everyone? Yes, no. Very simple algorithm, right? And the nice thing over here is that the alpha for the final node in the graph, this bottom right node, which aligns the final symbol in our sequence to the final time is actually the total probability of 
all the alignments of the entire label sequence to the entire input. So this is the, the actual, actually just the total probability of the label sequence. And also, uh, is it necessary to compute the alphas in the top right over here? You don't need to, if you, but you don't really want to be keeping special cases. And so if you just did this, if you were writing code, you know, easy code, you just do the, you, you just do this for all the nodes in every column. And uh, things just get, get handled by the fact that these terms have been initialized to zero, so they get handled out here. And they get handled out here by the fact that you're simply ignoring these alphas. But you don't really need to compute them. So, uh, right. And so we've seen how to compute the, this forward probability, which is the alpha tr, this alpha tr term for every node in the graph. But if you can, so, and in the process, when you've computed this, applied the forward algorithm, you would have also computed the alpha tr term for this node. And so uh, let me just replace this first probability with the alpha tr itself. We've seen how to compute this. So now we are left with the second term, which is the total probability of the all paths leading from TR to the sink node. This is what we represented as beta TR, and we call this the backward probability. Now the backward probability over here, beta TR, is the total is the total probability of the entire subgraph that follows the node TR, shown in orange, but doesn't include this node itself. So it's the total probability of the exposed subgraph not including this node. Now this orange node has two children. You can either go from the orange node to the green node, and from there you can go to the sink node, or you can go from the orange node to the, this, this red node, and from there to the sink node. So the total probability of the subgraph that follows this orange node is the total is the probability of going to this of the subgraph starting from this green node to the sink plus the probability of the subgraph starting from the red node, red node to the sink. So is this making sense to you guys? Is this making sense? Yes, no. And again, you can see the simplicity, right? I can pull out the probability of the green node itself outside. And so this first term is the probability of the green node times the probability of the subgraph that follows the green node plus the probability of the red node times the probability of the subgraph that follows the red node. What are these guys? Anyone? This is another recurrence relationship, kind of like the other one. Exactly right. This is this this one. This first term was just beta. This is the first row. It's beta four one, and this one is going to be beta four two, right? Uh, so you ended up with this little recursion. The beta three one over here was y e four times beta four one plus y f four times beta four two. Or more generally, I can write this as uh, the beta TR is the uh, probability of the R symbol at time T plus one times beta T plus one R plus the probability of the R plus one symbol at time T plus one times beta, beta, beta T plus one R plus one. So this is very specific to the kind of graph that we drew. But then you can also generalize it further and say beta TR is the sum over all successors of the TR node of the probability of the successor node times the beta of the successor node. So what has happened is that you've expressed each beta term in terms of the beta in the next column. And now you can use this to form a recursive relation. So algorithm, so here's the algorithm. We start with the final time. At the final time, we have only one sync node. So, and none of the other nodes, nodes are valid terminating nodes. So 
these guys are going to have the prob the probability of following this is zero. So this is these guys are going to have beta values of zero. And since this deterministically ends the alignment, the probability of this node beta t, the beta term for this node is going to be one. Subsequently, you can wind your way backwards and using all the beta terms over here, you can compute all the beta terms in this column. Use those to compute the beta terms here and go all the way back to the initial column and compute all of the beta terms for all of the nodes in the network. I have some pseudocode for both the forward and the backward algorithms in the slides. I'm not going to go over them all. You can go over them on your own, but please do so, right? So is the forward and backward computation clear to everybody? Yes or no? Yeah. Okay. And so returning to the computation of the total probability of all paths that align the R symbol to time T, we have seen how to compute the probability of this pink graph, which is alpha TR. We've also seen how to compute this, this second term, which is beta TR. And so the total probability of all paths that go through this node, the TR node, is simply going to be alpha TR times beta TR. And, and but then all of this computation is actually required to compute the expected divergence. And that actually requires the a posteriori probability of aligning the R symbol at time t. So you want to compute the probability that the R symbol is aligned to is, is aligned to time t, given the complete label sequence and the input. So in order to do, whereas what you computed over here is the joint probability of this alignment and the label sequence. So in order to compute this posterior probability, what we will do is divide, uh, we're basically, uh, we're going to divide this joint probability by the probability of S given X, but it's easier to see it uh, mechanically. We get some probabilities for, uh, for these uh, probabilities for each of these nodes. We are going to normalize these probabilities by summing them up and dividing the probabilities by the sum. So we're, go we're going to normalize the product of alpha and beta at each of these nodes by the sum of these products computed over the entire column. And that will give us the a posteriori probability of aligning the R symbol to the TF time given the input label sequence and the input in, in, and the input itself. So is this computation making sense to you guys? Yes or no? Okay. I'm taking the two or three S's that I see. I have a quick question. Uh, yeah. Uh, so what is the rationale of using this computation over by turby training? Because here you're considering all possible alignments, correct? And when you perform Viterbi training, uh, you're always choosing one alignment. Now, when you begin training your model, how good is your model? It's gonna be pretty crappy, yeah. right? So how good is the alignment it gets going to be? Horrible also, Not correct? very good. Yes, and so the models will quickly go into local minima and train poorly. Whereas here you're averaging over all possible alignments. So you're also considering the alternate alignments, which might be more correct. And so this is going to give you a better result overall. And principle. I see, thank you. Right. So beam search is a different thing altogether. Okay, we'll get to that. So this is constrained. Now, this term I'm going to represent as the posterior probability gamma TR. So gamma TR is alpha TR times beta TR divided by the sum of the product of alpha and T over the entire column at time T. Now, 
the returning to the problem of computing the expected divergence across all alignments that simply ended up being this term it's the negative of the sum over all time of the sum over all symbols at that time of the posterior probability of the nodes times the log probability of the node that's what this expected divergence was and this posterior probability ended up being gamma tr and the log of the probability of the node itself is this log ytsm which is the log of the probability of the symbol corresponding to that row at that time so now this becomes a very simple computation because gamma tr has been computed and uh, from these we can compute we now have to compute the partial derivative of this divergence with respect to the output of the network not the column over here but what we are really speaking of now is we want to compute let me go back way back if i can come on that's a long long distance away because we were on slide 75 but we want to compute the derivative of that divergence with respect to this vector which is the complete set of probabilities output by the network although this table only selected some of these entries right so and so that's what uh, we will do and if you compute that derivative firstly let's see where was my well, in slide 77, I think. Yeah. We want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the probabilities assigned to every symbol, not just the ones over here. And, and so you want to compute the derivative of this divergence with respect to all of these terms. And these derivative terms must come from here, from this divergence. And since uh, we are only interested in a specific time instant t, y, because you want the derivative with respect to a specific y t, you can drop the summation over t. And so now we just want to uh, and focus on the contribution of the tth column. And so this derivative over here doesn't sum over time but only sums over entries in the tth column second uh, if you are considering any one symbol in the vocabulary something over here then that symbol might occur multiple times in this table for example when you had b phi the e occurred twice so the probability that the network computed for e occurred twice in this table so you would be computing the derivative of the divergence with respect to the probabilities at both of these nodes and summing them to compute the corresponding derivative term within this uh, within this overall uh, overall derivative of the divergence with respect to the output at time t so having done that now we just need to figure out what this derivative is what is the derivative of gamma tr times the log log probability assigned to any symbol at time t which should have been r i guess uh, to any symbol with respect to the uh, various output symbols now if you work this out this is going to be the derivative of gamma tr itself chain rule uh, this is going to be the, the derivative of the log which means if i take this if i take the derivative of gamma times log with respect to y it's going to be gamma gamma times the derivative of log y which is gamma over y plus the derivative of gamma times log y that's the chain rule and this second term over here it turns out is actually uh, quite challenging to compute but then we'll we'll make a simple approximation and we'll just ignore it it turns out that if you ignore the second term and approximate this derivative with just the first term alone 
you can think of it as a maximum likelihood estimate. And if you think of it as a maximum likelihood estimate, then this approximation is in fact exact. And so we get this formula for the derivative of the expected divergence with respect to the uh, probability assigned by the network to any symbol L at time t. It is the negative of the inverse of YLT times the sum over all of the rows with the symbol L of gamma t r. So basically R represents all the rows where the symbol is L and it's going to be the sum of all of the gammas there times minus one over the probability assigned to the symbol. So uh, you can use this to compute the derivative for each symbol and thereby the gradient of the divergence for the entire network output at any time. We have a poll. Ten seconds, guys. So the algorithm that we just saw is the forward backward algorithm, and it's used to compute the a posteriori probability of aligning each symbol in the compressed sequence to each input. So this is true. And these probabilities are required to compute the expected divergence across all alignments of the label sequence to the input. So this is also true. So both statements are true. And so here is the overall training procedure when we are given training data that have input sequences and unaligned output sequences. First, we set up the network, typically a many layered LSTM and initialize all its parameters. Then for each training instance in the forward pass, we pass the data through the net and obtain the complete set of symbol, complete table of symbol probabilities for every symbol at every time. Then once we have this complete probability table, we copy the rows corresponding to the symbols in our unaligned target output to get the sequence specific table and construct the graph from it. Again, remember a symbol may occur multiple times in the sequence specific table. Then we perform the forward backward algorithm to compute the alphas and the betas for every node in this graph, every node in this table. And from them, we compute the gammas for every node. Then from the gammas, we compute the derivatives of the divergence with respect to the network output for every time and for the derivative uh, at for the derivative step we do to you we use this formula that we just derived and then finally we aggregate the derivatives over an entire mini batch we, we propagate these uh, derivatives of the divergence with respect to the output of the network back through the net and then aggregate these derivatives over the entire mini batch and update network parameters. And so the story so far is this, sequence to sequence networks which irregularly output symbols can be decoded by Viterbi decoding, uh, which assumes that a symbol is output at each time and merges adjacent symbols. They require alignment of the output of the symbol sequence for training, which is generally not given. Training can be performed by iteratively estimating the alignment by Viterbi decoding and time synchronous training. Alternately, it can be performed by optimizing the expected error over all possible alignments. Posterior probabilities for the expectation can be computed using the forward backward algorithm. So now let's return to a problem that we glossed over. 
say we are recognizing character sequence sequences and an input is now uh, decoded using our greedy procedure into this time aligned sequence r r r e e e e d is this sequence does this time aligned sequence represent the compressed uh, sequence red or does it represent greed we can't say this is ambiguous right and we've actually seen this problem problem before when i showed you this example a long time ago so we have this problem we cannot distinguish from this time aligned decode whether the actual word was read or read the two are indistinguishable so to resolve this we are going to introduce an extra invisible symbol whose job is to separate repetitions so that they become distinguishable distinguishable i'm going to call the symbol a blank and represent it by a hyphen this blank serves only one purpose in life it separates distinct symbols otherwise it's invisible so it appears in the time aligned sequence but when you compress the time aligned sequence the blank disappears except that the symbols on either side of it stay separate so for example if i compress this time aligned sequence r r r blank 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 e e blank 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 d d d this is going to the repetitions of r will compress to r the repetitions of e will compress to e the repetitions of d will compress to d so this becomes red if i compress this one r r blank e double blank e e d the repetitions of r are going to become r this e is going to compress to e but this e is separated from these two e's because they are separated by a blank so these two e's now form a separate new symbol e and then you get a d so this actually compresses to read similarly this guy over here r r blank r three blanks double e three blanks d blank d d these two r's are going to become an r this r which is separated from these two stays an r these two e's become an e this d is a d and then these two d's compress to a d so you can see how it actually disambiguates now here's this sequence over here can you tell me what this symbol sequence compresses to anyone let's see you're right so it's actually 3d's because you have 2d's over here that becomes a d and then this is d there's this d and there's this d but yes you got it you nailed it so now what we observe is that the next symbol after a blank is always a new character the important bit here is that if you have a compressed sequence with repeated symbols like read then in any alignment of it there must always be one or one or more blanks between the two repetitions of e if you don't have a blank have a blank then the alignment will compress to the wrong sequence so blanks are optional between two symbols that are different like between r and d over here you have a blank but even if you didn't this would compress to the same two word two symbols but the blanks are mandatory between repetitions of a symbol like over here if i want read then i need need a blank between uh the sequence that represents the first e and the sequence that represents the second e now to account for this blank ah yes beautiful almost everybody is getting it all right so 10 seconds guys only the last one was correct this is simply going to become b i l y this is going to become b b i l l y so this you're going to end up with two b's over here this is going to become b i l y because these two l's will collapse 
this is the only sequence that becomes Billy. So you're right. This last one, the most popular, popular answer was the correct one. So now to account for the blank, we need to expand the symbol set recognized by the network to also include the blank symbol. And during training, we must train the model to also recognize the blank. So when the network computes outputs from an input, the output will now include the probability of blank at each time, as shown by this top row over here, because this blank is now a new symbol in its vocabulary. And it will modify how we compress decodes. So for example, if the red boxes showed the most likely symbol at each time, then the greedy decode over here is simply going to collapse to B, B. Which is, but then what would this decode, which also has blank, compressed to? Does anyone want to, want to guess? What is this going to collapse to? Anyone? Apparently, no one wants to take a chance. The blank will disappear. You're going to get same thing. You're going to get beefy again. You get B, E. These blanks disappear, disappear, F, and E. But then what about this one? What will this become? Anyone? Let me tell you. Double F. Two F sounds. Double F. B, E, F. Then a, because there's a blank, a second F and then E. So you get a double F, right? So perfect. So here's what we get with blanks. Introducing blanks changes the way in which we compose the graph to compute a posteriori probabilities for symbols. So let's say our unaligned sequence is beefy or actually B if I've changed, switched the order of symbols so that I get this repeated symbol over here. I need a better example than this. I say that every time, but I never change this picture. Uh, now, if I use the original method we saw earlier, this is the reduced probability table we'd construct. And this, so this, is, this would be the graph which we'd use. But if we use this graph, any alignment that we get from this graph is going to compress to B with just one E rather than two E's because the E's are not separated by a blank. So here's what we will get with blanks. We will introduce one row of blanks between any two symbols. So we will also have rows of, we will, we will also have rows of blanks at the very top and at the very bottom because alignments can begin or end with blanks. And um, representing the probability of a blank as computed by the network with Y superscript B. And so this YB0 is the probability of blank at time zero, at time one, and so on. So this is going to be the modified table where I have a row of blanks between any two symbols. And now we add edges such that all the paths from the initial nodes to the final nodes represent a symbol sequence that unambiguously uh, uh, compresses to our target which is B, E, E, F in our case. So first, some, some changes. The initial symbol in an alignment could either be a blank or the first symbol B. So there are two allowed initial nodes. Similarly, the final symbol in an alignment could either be the last symbol F or a blank. So there are two possible final nodes as well. A valid alignment could start at either of these two nodes at the top left and end at this either of these two nodes at the bottom right. And if we get all of these arrows just right, it will represent an alignment of B, double E, B, E, E, F, right? With the two E's. Now, but there's more to compose. Blanks are optional between two symbols which are distinctive, which are not the same. So on, 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 so on an alignment, you can either have B followed by blank, and then followed by E, or you can have a B and you can immediately follow an E. So this is shown by this arrow to the left. You can have B followed by blank, followed by E, or B can immediately followed by E. 
be followed by E, and both of them represent, represent the compressed sequence B. So when you go on this graph, you will have arrows from B down to blank and from blank to E, but also have arrows from B directly to E. But for the two repeated E's, you cannot go directly from this E to this E because if you have a path which goes from E to E without the intervening, intervening blank, that is going to compress the two E's into a single E. So to go from an E to the next E, you must go through the blank. So for these E rows, you only have an arrow to the next blank row. And from the blank row, you have an arrow to the next E row. And so uh, also, obviously, you cannot have an arrow from a blank row to a blank row. That's skipping the intervening symbol. Because if you do that, then you, then you wouldn't be aligning the intervening symbol. So uh, here is the overall set of rows, and set of rules. Skips are allowed across a blank, but only if the two symbols on either side of the blank are different, because a blank is mandatory between repetitions of a symbol, and, and no skips are, are allowed between two blanks. That's how you compose this graph. So is this making sense, guys? Is this graph construction making sense to you? Yes or no? Yeah. Uh, why do we need a blank at the beginning and the end? Because the blank is a nothing symbol, right? So it is possible to have blank, 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 B, B, and that's going to compress to a B, correct? Uh, yeah, correct. That's why. OK. So I have some pseudo code for how to construct, compose the blank graph of blanks. I won't explain it. Please go over it yourself. And now, if you want to perform Viterbi alignment, you can perform Viterbi alignment over this graph. And it's going to be the same algorithm as what we saw earlier except when you consider the predecessors for any node, the predecessors must come from this graph. Some nodes will have three predecessors, other nodes will have two predecessors. So I actually have a pseudo code for the uh, Witterby alignment as well. Uh, here, uh, this is just like the Witterby algorithm, except that in some rows, you will have three predecessors, in other rows, you'll have two predecessors. We also have to modify the forward algorithm. If you want to use the training without alignment, you'll have to modify the forward algorithm for the new graph. Now we get alpha values for the first two nodes, and then the rest will be set to zero. And the alpha values will simply be the node probabilities, the probability of the blank over here, and the probability of the first symbol on the sequence for the second node, which here is y b zero. All the remaining alphas are going to be zero. And then for each subsequent column, we compute alphas for every node going down, except that we're going to use this formula. So to compute the alpha for any node, we're going to be summing the alphas for all of the predecessors of that node, and then multiplying by the node, node probability. And some nodes will have one predecessor, some nodes will have two predecessors, some nodes will have three predecessors. So you have to be careful. Generally, uh, if the symbol in any row is either a blank or if the symbol in any row is the same as the symbol two rows earlier before the blank that preceded it, then you will only be summing two alpha terms. Otherwise, if the symbol in the row is neither a blank nor a repetition, then you will be summing three alpha terms. And so you can use this, this simple modification for how alphas are computed and compute alphas for all the nodes in your graph. Similarly, we must modify the backward algorithm to accommodate the blanks. First, now, first, we now set the beta values for the first last two nodes in the last column to one. And again, this is because the final symbol and the alignment could either be the final unaligned symbol or the blank. The rest of the beta values are zero. And now, now we can go backwards in time and compute the beta values for all the nodes in each column 
from the betas in the next column. And again, remember the formula for this, the beta for any node is the sum over all of the successors of that node of the product of the node probability and the beta for that node itself. Different nodes will have different numbers of successes. Some of the bottom row will have only one. Amongst the others, some nodes will have two successors. Some nodes will have three successes. So the uh, computation rules are going to change a bit. The beta for any node is going to sum over two terms. If it belongs to a row that, are, that is a blank, or if it belongs to a row such that it is the first in a sequence of repeated symbols. For other beta, for other rows, the beta terms are going to be a sum of three terms. And then once you've computed the alphas and betas, you're going to compute the rest of the computation proceeds exactly as before. You just compute the posteriors from the alphas and betas and compute the derivative for every yt from the posteriors. The only difference is that now we have to use the extended graph with blacks. So here is the overall training procedure after inclusion of blanks. It's very similar to the earlier procedure. We're given training data comprising inputs and their unaligned target outputs. We first set up the network, initialize its parameters. But now don't forget to include the blank in the output symbol set for the network. Then for each training instance in the forward pass, pass the input through the net and uh, shouldn't the start and end not be one? Are you speaking of the betas? For the betas, it's going to be one. Basically, you're saying that the subsequent graph, it is the probability of the graph that follows, so it's going to be one. And that's only in the last column. For the alphas, there's nothing that's being initialized to one. Right? So anyway, coming back here, for the, after we have set up the network and initialized the parameters, you pass the input, and now you also have the blank as a symbol. You pass the input through the net and compute this output probability table. Then construct this graph for the target symbol sequence using the probabilities output by the net and make sure to include the blanks properly in the graph. Then perform the forward backward algorithms to compute the alphas and betas for all nodes. And from those, you compute the gammas, the posterior probabilities. Then you compute the derivatives of the divergence with respect to the vector of symbol probabilities output by the net at each time using this familiar formula, same as before. And then finally, you prop back propagate these derivatives through the network and ag aggregate the derivatives over the mini batch to update parameters. So the overall framework that we just saw, saw is referred to as connectionist temporal classification or CTC. It applies to models that output order aligned but time asynchronous outputs. Questions, anyone? Any questions? Okay, no. So we've seen now how to train these models properly. Let's go back to another old problem, inference with the model, what we call decoding. We've seen that the greedy decoding procedure simply, that simply picks the most likely symbol, symbol at each time and then merges the resulting symbol sequence is in fact suboptimal, even if you use blanks. And that's because it only finds the, finds the most likely time aligned sequence, not the best order aligned sequence, which is what we want. To see what I mean, consider a model for which we have these candidate time aligned decodes. By candidate decode, I mean uh, time aligned symbol, time aligned symbol sequences that could be uh, that could be output obtained from the output of the network. So these character sequences show the time aligned symbol sequences. And within the parentheses, I show you the, the compressed sequence that can be obtained from this time aligned sequence and the probability of the time aligned sequence itself. Now, if this is the complete set of possible time aligned outputs from the network, what will the final, uh, if you're using greedy decode, what will the final output of the network be? Is it going to be red or is it going to be tagged? 
Anyone? What's it going to be? Ted. Ted, because it's the most likely, right? But which one seems most reasonable? Red. Red, because it's got a lot of uh, high probability in, in similar decoding. Correct, because although you have many different minor variants of the same alignment, all of them have high probability. So across all alignments, red has much higher probability than Ted. But greedy decoding is going to pick up Ted. So uh, that's that's suboptimal. Now, it's not that greedy decoding is a, is, a, is a disaster. In fact, it works quite well because if you train the model well, then the blank becomes a great catch-all. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, here's a wonderful example from, from Graves' paper for how the greedy CTC decoder actually works. This third panel is the most important one. It shows the probability assigned to various symbols against time. And this dotted line shows you the probability of the blank symbol. And what you observe is that over large stretches of time, the only symbol which has any significant probability is the blank symbol. The other symbols' probabilities only sort of peak towards the end of the symbol. So even if you applied a greedy decode to an output of this kind, you're naturally going to get decodes of this type, blank, blank, R, blank, 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 E, blank, 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 D, which will compress to uh, unambiguous outputs with minimum alignment ambiguity. So this won't be that suboptimal. Nevertheless, in principle, this process remains suboptimal. And guys, I'm going to go five minutes over. Please stay with me. And the reason for that is that the actual objective of the decoding is to find the most likely order aligned symbol sequence, not just the most likely time aligned symbol sequence. In other words, we want to find the order aligned sequence S0 to SK minus one given an input x0 to xt minus one, such that this order aligned sequence we choose is the most probable one for the given input. In math, we want to perform an odd max over all symbol sequences, such that the posterior probability of the sequence given the input is maximum. So, and this probability is computed over all possible alignments. Now, recall that for any order aligned sequence, the total probability of all alignments for the sequence is the alpha value to the bottom right node of the alignment graph for the sequence. So uh, you, earlier we were, we were just representing it as alpha t minus one, k minus one, but because this is for the specific sequence, I'm also going to add the sequence itself as a subscript to alpha over here. And so our actual decoding objective is to find the sequence S such that if we composed a graph of this kind for that sequence and computed the final alpha value, that alpha value is the highest. You want to find the sequence S for which this alpha value is highest. Unfortunately, to compute this, we would have to explicitly compute alpha for every sequence, and there's an exponential number of such sequences and finding final alphas for all of them one at a time is just not feasible. So our solution is to organize all possible sequences into a form of tree to minimize duplicate computation. So I was supposed to have a poll over here, but I'll skip it, I'll just move on. So what do I mean by representing it as a C? Three. So let's consider a trivial example where I have only two symbols, blank and S1, S1 and S2. Now the kinds of sequences I can, I can construct from this are S1, S2, right? Then I can construct S1, S2, S1, S1, S2, S2, right? S2, S1, and so on. But then I'm going to just not I'll just consider just these sequences. I'm also going to add the blank, invisible blank. So the actual sequences I can construct are just blank S1, S2, blank S1, blank S2, and so on, right? 
So is this set of possibilities making sense to you guys? Is it making sense? Guys? Yes, no. Well, I'll take that one yes as representing everybody. So if I look at all of these guys, the first symbol can be a blank. The blank can be followed by either an S1 or an S2. But then uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, first symbol could also be an S1 or an S2, right? But we'll ignore that for the moment. Now this S1 can be followed by an S2, but an S1 cannot, then the S1 can be followed by a blank followed by an S1 because an S1 cannot directly be followed by an S1. The S1 can also be followed by a blank and then followed by an S2. But then when I when an S1 is followed by a blank and then followed by an S2, that represents the same sequence as S1, S2 itself, which is why I've drawn this arrow from the blank to S, S2 over here. So this is not a real tree, it's like a semi-tree. So this portion of the semi-tree represents all two symbol sequences that start with S1. Similarly, this portion of the semi-tree represents all two symbol sequences that start with S2. The same structure repeats from here. This S1 can be followed by S2 or a blank in S1 or a blank in S2. And I can repeat the structure all over. And I can keep extending the length of the sequence by repeating these structures beyond the third layer and adding more and more levels. And this structure represents all possible symbol sequences that I can compose with S1 and S2. So from this tree, I'm going to compose a graph. This vertical figure over here is just the tree drawn vertically. Now I'll form a table with one row per symbol. And this table is going to obtain the probabilities for that symbol from the output of the network and lay it out. So each column over here is going to be one time instant. And each row is going to represent one symbol on this tree. Each node over here, each intersection over here is the alignment of one symbol from the tree to one input time instant. And so these intersections were the cells that we saw in our earlier representation. Now these intersections are the nodes in our graph. So I'm going to draw an arrow from a, from, from, from a node here in one column to a node in the other column. If there's an arrow from the corresponding symbol here to the symbol corresponding to the destination. So I can draw an arrow from here to here because I have an arrow from here to here, but I cannot draw an arrow from here from this node to this node because I don't have an arrow from here to here, right? Now there's something special about this tree. If you look at every node in this tree, every node represents a unique compressed symbol sequence. Every path from the source to this S2 represents the compressed symbol sequence S1, S1, S2. Every path to the second S2, to this symbol here, represents the compressed symbol sequence S2, S1, S2. It doesn't matter how, which path you follow, it's going to re represent the same compressed symbol sequence. So what that means over here is that every node in this graph represents a unique compressed symbol sequence. So if you uh, had an alignment which went from here, any path from the source from this point to this node, any path at all from this point to, to this node is going to represent the same compressed symbol sequence. And so now I can just go from left to right and perform the forward algorithm at each node you're going to get an alpha that is the total probability of all, of all alignments of the symbol sequence represented by that node to the input. And so we will compute the alphas for the full input. And then finally, at the final column, you're going to select the node with the highest alpha and output the corresponding sequence with one refinement. Remember that when you have blanks, there are actually two final nodes that represent the same sequence. So at the final time over here, there are actually uh, two nodes that represent, represent the same sequence, one for the sequence itself 
and one for the sequence followed by black. So for example, I have alpha S2 and I have alpha S2 black. So I'm going to sum these two alphas to get the total probability of the compressed sequence that is just S2. Similarly, I'll have alpha S1, S1, and further up, I'll have alpha S1, S1 blank. I'd sum those two alphas to get the alpha for S1, S1. And then I pick the symbol sequence for the largest alpha. So this is the theoretically correct CTC decoder. It's going to pick, it's going to give you the most likely order aligned sequence for the input. In practice, this tree, and so this graph is going to grow exponentially large with time and we can't really evaluate alphas for all nodes. So to prevent this blow up, we'll employ pruning strategies. At each time, we go through the nodes at that time and only retain a fixed number of the highest scoring nodes. Here, for example, we are deleting all but the four best scoring nodes. So over here, although we have several nodes, we are only retaining these four. Only those four values are, ex are extended to the next column. And here again, while we have so many nodes that we have com computed, we are retaining only these best four and so on. So as a result, while we go through the computation at any time, you're only going to have a fixed number of nodes in your graph. The computation doesn't blow up. Blow up. This will result in suboptimal decodes. But then fortunately, as we saw, the symbol probabilities, because when, when we use blanks, symbol probabilities only peak at the end of the sequence. So the suboptimality is not great. Uh, I have some very clear pseudocode on beam search for beam search on the slides. We also went over it in detail in the recitation. So I'll skip it now, but please go over the code carefully. And if you want, I can record a separate short lecture explaining it as well. So let me just skip over it. And so here's our story so far. The uh, final bit is what we just added. Decoding models can be performed by best path decoding. That is Viterbi decoding, which I'm going to call Viterbi decoding. Actually, this is a misnomer. Let's just call this best, best path decoding. Or you can perform optimal CTC decoding based on the application of the forward algorithm to a tree structured representation of all output strings with pruning for beam search. There are some caveats. The blank structure that we saw is only one way to deal with the problem of repeating symbols. There are other ways. Uh, for example, symbols can be partitioned into two or more sequential subunits, uh, like we did in homework one. Their blanks are not required. You can have symbol specific blanks. This is this will double your vocabulary. The uh, CTC network the network that actually computes the probability table can be unidirectional or bidirectional. We typically actually use bidirectional networks and there are other variants possible. The most common applications for CTC are speech recognition and handwriting recognition. Speech goes in or images go in, images go in and phoneme or character sequences come in. And speech rec in particular, which you're going to have in your, which you have in your homework, we use recurrent networks with LSTMs to compute the probability tables and perform CTC decode on the output. So speech features come in and the output is a probability table from which we compute a phonetic label sequence. And we could either directly output phoneme sequences or even word sequences, or as it turns out, you can even directly output spellings. So that is all in this lecture. Our next topic is sequence to sequence models where we don't even assume order synchrony between the input and the output. We'll see that in the next class. I'll stop this recording over here and I'll take questions.